All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 30th day of September in the year of our Lord, 2023. And I'd like to talk today, in more or less, to my, uh, my independent fundamentalist brethren. Uh, I did a video just the other day where I was talking about, is it the last bastion of Christianity? Uh, because everything else seems to be falling into apostasy, including evangelicalism in the United States, which has been going downhill since at least World War II with the advent of uh, Billy Graham's neo-evangelicalism, although our new evangelicalism. Uh, it wasn't just Billy Graham's idea, but he's the most visible uh, spokesman for it, or was. <clears throat> uh, evangelicalism is about where Billy Graham is in the grave, pretty much rotting. <sighs> just yet, it's, it has lost its way. And there's a reason for that. It was uh, it it was created because uh, uh, Graham and some fellow former fundamentalists decided that the way to reach the world was to become more like the world, to reject biblical separation. Part of that was because separationism among fundamentalists and fundamentalists aren't restricted to Baptists got out of hand. So I want to talk about the history of the fun, of fundamentalism in the United States and why we need to go back to the beginning. We need to return to the beginning of it and understand how things have evolved a bit and go back to what fundamentalism was, which is traditional, orthodox, old evangelicalism. What sets, sets evangelicalism apart from what we could call orthodox Christianity in general? Uh, lots of Christians have orthodox theology, or they did. They did. Uh, much of uh, the theology of Roman Catholicism is orthodox as far as the theology of Christ as far as our theology of who he is and what he did, they even have an orthodox theology of the Bible. In a way, the, the Council of Trent, you know, the anti-Protestant Council of Trent, uh, which is still considered authoritative in the Roman Catholic Church, except by Francis. Of course, Francis doesn't believe anything except his own amorphous, whatever it is. He believes the devil, that's what it is. Uh, that's, his, that's his God. Uh, he's he's a destroyer of all that is left that's orthodox in, Christi in, in Catholicism, which is half of the Christian world, okay? Uh, at, the, at the beginning of the 19th century, roughly, I mean, this was developing in the, uh, or throughout the 19th century. It was de a developing thing. You know, we could sort of point the figure, a finger at Darwin in many ways, the rise of, of pseudoscience, which is what Darwinism is. Uh, uh, you had psychology, too, with Freud and others developing. So what happened is the so-called, I guess you could call this modern science as opposed to traditional science that was, you had Christian science that was rooted in the reality of creation. God made it. And all the great scientists of history had Christian, uh, a Christian view of things in, in the sense that they, real, they believed that God created the heavens and the earth. 
and all that is in them. Uh, and so that's, that they did not, but science became atheistic. That man in his arrogance began to believe that God was not necessary and because of the sinful nature of mankind and the desire of man to suppress the knowledge of God because he doesn't like God because God reveals that he's a sinner. And there's an adversary relationship there, generally from the sinner's part, that they began to use science as a tool to suppress the knowledge of God. And much of Christianity, of Protestant Christianity, bought into it. And of course, this is this has also affected Roman Catholicism, but they were a little bit behind on that. And so all the mainline denominations surrendered to the new false science that proves the Bible's false and God doesn't exist and all this stuff. They, they gave in to the world. They, they, they saw this and they were convinced by the arguments of Darwin that the Bible's false. You, want, you can't throw Genesis out without throwing Christ out. It's just a problem. You can't. Because in Genesis, we, we learn not only that God created all things in six days. If there's a God, that's not a problem. But because of the sinful nature of humanity, and of course that sinful nature affected science, because science is not just the facts, but it's an explanation of what is observed, because they didn't want have a didn't want God in that explanation because of their sinful nature, and you have unregenerate Christianity, which is already wants to go in that direction anyway. So here Darwin came along with an excuse why you don't need to believe the Bible because it's false, but it's not false. But that's the nature of sinful humanity. They they want to suppress that knowledge. They want to hide from God to hide their they're con they want God out of their consciousness, as the Scripture reveals very clearly, especially in Romans chapter 1 and 2 and 3. Uh, but at, at, the turn of, at the beginning of the 20th century, end of the 19th century, you had this, this surrender by uh, the majority of Protestantism into this modernist, um, capitulating to modernist science, the atheistic science. And they just basically threw up their hands. Well, this has obviously true, because science says so. <laughs> Understanding nothing, because they weren't born again, they just went with the flow, with the world, because that's what they're of. These people, especially the leaders in denominations, uh, born-again Christians don't want to be in those places because Christ isn't in those places. Those are man-made things. They're of the world. And so they threw up their hands and surrendered, but they still called themselves Christians when they weren't, never were. And then those who were Christians, those who were born again, who did hold to the Scripture, were forced out, quite literally forced out. They, they were, like we've seen in the last few years in the United Methodists, this battle between those who believe the Bible and those who don't, and how eventually now they've just, the believers have just thrown up their hands and said, we cannot live with you, so we're leaving. You, you want to go with the world, you want to go and affirm LGBTQ and all this other stuff that the world affirms, because you love the world. You're not brothers in Christ. We need to separate. And that's been like, you know, and the other side has been making that as difficult as possible because they want to corrupt you. They believe that you have to be like them. That's the way the world is. Have you noticed? Cancel culture. If you're not like them, you're the enemy. That's all they care about. Because they're right. Because they believe they're right. They are uh, uh, make themselves out to be God. 
But the, the struggle at the, say, the beginning of the 20th century, and then you had the Scopes trial and all these things, was a struggle within Christianity, within Protestantism in particular, uh, between the Bible believers and the believers in, of the, uh, the new sciences, the social sciences, Darwinism and all that. that. So they, that was their authority. They rejected the Scripture. Now, this was already been prepared by Satan through textual criticism and, and everything coming out of Germany. It was already set up. Has anything good ever come out of Germany? Uh, but it was already, you know, Satan has been working over generations to destroy the church. He's been at war with the church forever. Catholicism is one of his uh, greatest works because it, it's in there you see the gospel being obscured. Doesn't outright reject it, just layers it over and separates you from Christ. You have to go through the church. And it's just set up. You can see how this all interplays with the sinfulness of humanity, the fallenness of man and this is a tendency that people naturally want to go anyway. To put God at arm's distance. Put something between me and God. Put that curtain back up in the temple that separates the Holy of Holies, God himself, from us. We don't want to see him. Cover our eyes. Give us some fig leaves. That's fallen man. Has always been like that. It's only in Christ that 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 is that breach is repaired. And they rejected him. See, modernism rejected because they they adopted the naturalistic view of of modern science, which was a new science, not historic. See, Christianity gave birth to real science because it has a God who is the creator, a God who is self-consistent. So his creation is self-consistent. A God who has revealed himself, his existence, and his power in creation. Didn't re doesn't reveal everything about himself in creation. Everything about himself is revealed in Christ. But the basics that he is, and he is awesomely powerful, and awesomely wise, is revealed in creation. So, Satan has to get that out of the picture. And he was very successful at it. So you had the unbelieving Christ Protestant world that rejected the Bible because they accepted the, uh, the modern science as unassailable. Because they were fallen already and never regenerated. And then the minority who, who held fast to the scriptures became known as the fundamentalists because of a series of uh, essays that were published uh, in, a, I think there was like 12 books, 12 little thin books of these essays from various Christians about uh, evolution and about the fundamentals of the faith. The, the, fun, the word fundamentalist comes from the modernists had denied the very fundamentals of the faith. The, uh, the deity of Christ, his virgin birth, his... Uh, his life and his miracles, his, the literal truth of his miracles, these things. He literally did these things. Of course we believe that, right? Obvious. All Christians believe that, right? No, they didn't. Most of them rejected those. His atoning death and literal resurrection, physical resurrection, modernists denied them all. And there were some, uh, the neo-Orthodox, for example, they just made it so fuzzy they used traditional language, but their meaning was changed. So neo-orthodoxy uh, pretended to affirm, but actually denies satanic speech, you know, doublespeak. Uh, and his uh, you know, physical resurrection and his ascension and his, his uh, return, although that is a, his literal return, um, although that is probably the least important of the, the actual fundamentals as far as salvation. Although our final salvation happens when he returns. Uh, yeah, we, we, our bodies, we're still in these mortal bodies that have sin in them. We're waiting the redemption of our bodies. And some of the, of course, Orthodox, um, Augustine was 
the, the denial of some of that goes way back to Augustine as far as the uh, the physical return of Christ and you know he didn't take much of the Bible including Genesis he did not take it literally he brought in well he no he didn't bring it in but he certainly looked at things allegorically and he invented his own Christianity, really. Augustinianism is not biblical Christianity. It's not New Testament Christianity. And that's what we're really talking about when we're talking about fundamentalism. See, fundamentalism was simply the old evangelicalism. And why say evangelicalism? Because the difference between evangelicalism and, say, non-evangelical Orthodox Christianity Orthodox Christianity holds to the Orthodox doctrines, but it does not put a stress on the uh, the need to be born again. They make born again part of being sprinkled as an infant. So it's the idea for so evangel uh, Lu evangelical Lutheranism, you know, like the e ELCA Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, they're not evangelical at all. It is without actually God saving you, a real salvation, not just a doctrine of salvation, but the thing itself, Christ in you, you're not a Christian. That is the divine, one of the, that is a real dividing line. That's where Paul puts it. Do you not know that it, Christ is in you? If any man uh, has, does not have the spirit of Christ, he's not, he's not of his, he's not of Christ. Being born again is absolutely essential. You can be ignorant of almost everything. You're not saved by doctrine. You're saved by Christ. Just hearing that, he, that, that of the basic, the fundamentals of who he is, he's the son of God, the sinless son of God who died on the cross for our sin and rose again as God's proof that he accomplished that. That's sufficient. Doesn't take a paragraph of doctrine to, to tell you what you need to know to be saved. And whosoever shall call upon his name shall be saved. Whosoever calls upon Christ to be saved, not calling on Christ to be saved from their, their problems, but to be saved from their sin and the judgment of God shall be saved. God's promise. You will be born again because it's something God does. In fact, the very conviction that leads you to cry out comes from God. <clears throat> That's old evangelicalism. It has a strong emphasis on the need to be born again, like Jesus has a strong emphasis. And all of the New Testament has a strong emphasis on that. And the promise of that is given in the Old Testament, in the prophets especially Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Jeremiah chapter 31, Ezekiel chapter 36. We have the promise and description of the new covenant that Jesus would bring in. And the book of Hebrews tells all about that. Some people ignore that book. It's a bad book to ignore. Not the easiest book to understand, but it's bad to ignore it. Uh, so you have the Bible-believing people that that understood you must be born again. Those are the old evangelicals, the traditional evangelicals. And, and that evangelicalism dates back, well, to the New Testament, but in the Reformation, we see that really among certain elements of the Anabaptists, uh, Menno Simons, for example really put a heavy emphasis on uh, being born again. Uh, we don't know too much about what the other, some of the other Anabaptists taught because, well, they were Bible believers. That's why they were called Anabaptists. Uh, they, the Bible had become available. All the people that were in the, you know, like, like Martin Luther and the others, they were all Catholic priests. What happened is they got access to the Scripture and started reading the Scripture and believing the Scripture. And they were converted. Um, and Menno Simons was a 
Catholic priest also, and he started, his brother was in the rebellion at Munster, I think, and perished there, but that was not Anabaptist. Uh, the, so the, but Munster, uh, Menno Simons became eventually where the Mennonites come from, which are far removed from Menno Simons. Let me just put it that way. Uh, today, modern Mennonites generally are uh, followers of tradition alone. I mean, the, the Amish, there's some things about the Amish I actually admire quite a bit. But I always wonder, are they really saved? Because they, they are, their whole life seems to be involved around keeping their tradition and their own rules. Do they actually know Christ? And the, the largest Mennonite group is now apostate. They've gone the LGBTQ route too. See, because they're holding on to, to tradition rather than to Christ, hey, you got no anchor. Holding on to tradition rather than the scripture alone, you've got no anchor. So you're going to go that way. So that the, the basic idea of, the, of fundamentalism was simply those who hold to the scripture and the fundamentals of the faith, especially those fundamental doctrines in particular of Christ, which the modernists had denied. Modernists today, like a recent relative, uh, um, what's his name? I'm trying to think of a good example. Martin Luther King Jr. He was a modernist. Denied all the essentials of the faith. Denied Christ. Oh, he'd still use the word Christ. But he denied the virgin birth. He denied the divinity. He denied, well, maybe denied the divinity. Denied the virgin birth. Denied uh, his bodily resurrection. Denied, so though you deny those things, you don't have the Christ of the Bible. You don't have the Son of God, the Son of Man the one mediator between God and man. You just have this, this loose, moralistic mush that is modernism, that has faith in science, pseudoscience. It's like the science of textual criticism. Destroyed their faith in the Bible. Because they thought, oh, this proves the Bible's not accurate. It proves the Bible's full of errors. Ignorant people. They just believed science because these so-called self-proclaimed scientists said these things were so, instead of looking at the evidence themselves. So that was a controversy. So you had, again, it was the apostasy of, the, of Protestantism, the vast majority of Protestants, went apostate. And those who refused to go with them, who held to the old evangelicalism, you had, which was largely, this was largely an issue, uh, issue among the Baptists and the Presbyterians. It's where you had the fundamentalists. Lutheranism was, well, by this time, you know, I don't know why, but it wasn't really as, as much of an issue. But uh, because maybe they don't really care that much about doctrine. That could be. It's not always true, but uh, the sacramental church. That's it. I know what it is. That's it. That's right right there. It was why it affected the Baptists and the Presbyterians, because Presbyterians are Calvinists, and Calvinism is not as sacramental. It talks about the sacraments of means of grace, but it's not like that is not where salvation is rooted. It's not rooted in baptism. It's not rooted in the Lord's Supper. Uh, Calvin had a uh, was not a high church kind of guy. Um, like Anglicanism is like the Roman and Lutheranism are much more like Roman Catholicism, where it's a sacramental religion. Uh, this grace comes through the sacraments in the church. Uh, Anglicanism and Lutheranism to a lesser degree. Of course, there are evangelical elements among them, as opposed to the high church, which is a 
basically Catholicism with a different name and head. Uh, that's, I think that's why the, uh, those were less affected. Anglicanism wasn't affected so much by fundamentalism. But the, it's controversy because their, their, uh, their faith was centered on the church and the sacraments and not really on the person of Christ himself. <laughs> there's, a, there's this barrier in those churches that separates Christ from the person individually. So it's your salvation is through the organization, through the church, through the sacraments. But with Presbyterianism, because it's much more Bible-focused and not as sacramental-focused, and confesses the need to be born again, so it tends to be more evangelical. Uh, the the controversy affected it more. So you had when you destroy the 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 fundamental belief in in who Christ is, because faith in Christ is much more front and center there than it is in some of the high churches. Uh, fortunately, there's that's why the ELCA and uh, the well, you could say the same thing about the PCUSA, but they're, that's the apostate that that's modernist branch of the Presbyterians. Uh, but the Anglicans too. It's like if, if Christ never actually rose from the dead, would it make a difference to them? Uh, because it's not really uh, it, your faith isn't really in Him personally. It's in the church. That's where, at least, it where it tends to be. Even their doctrine won't say that, but that's where it goes. Uh, but the uh, so that's that's why it, it. I think that's why I just suddenly that's right. I think I realized that right just now. The Presbyterians and the Baptists were the ones most affected by it. Even the Methodists are are more sacramental than Baptists aren't sacramentalists at all. Uh, if you got a sacramentalist Baptist, you've got really something weird. What kind of a creature is that? No, see, Baptists, it's, 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 you must be born again. You must have personal faith in Christ. That's the hallmark of Baptists. Any Baptist is not there is what? I don't know what they are. And baptism is not the center. The weird thing about Baptists, baptism is not the center of anything. It's sort of this thing that's off to the side a little bit. We don't know quite what to do with uh, because it's not essential to salvation. No, a baptism is a testimony that God has saved you. Now, that's not the view of Presbyterians, but we don't want to get into that right now. But anyway, it was the, the Presbyterians and the Baptists in particular who found themselves engaged. And, 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 and theologically, actually, it was a, the Presbyterians were in the foreground of it because they're more theological than the Baptists. Uh, Baptists tend to be... Uh, the, uh, can we put it this way? Presbyterians are highbrow. Baptists are lowbrow. Uh, it's, it's Baptist was the frontier, the, the, the Western frontier is where the, the Baptists were spreading along with the Methodists. Going out, you know, the, the evangelists, they, they were the ones out preaching Christ and Christ crucified, faith in Christ as the means of salvation. Uh, whereas the, the other churches were, including the Presbyterians, were more of the established churches, and they weren't really so much out on the frontier. There were some. There were some. But uh, <laughs> and the Lutherans weren't really much of a presence in the United States at all at that time. They had come already, they, but they, uh, Lutheranism doesn't come from England. It comes from Germany and uh, Scandinavia. That's where they were where my ancestors came from, uh, especially Scandinavia. But that's more than I needed to say about that. But the, the, what was, the fundamentalists were, were simply the evangelicals, again, those who, who not only hold to the, the basic uh, doctrines of the essential doctrines, the fundamental doctrines of Christ, 
who he is, what he did. And the modernists denied that and the need to be born again. That's the common element between the Presbyterians and the, the Baptists. Believe it or not, whereas I never heard of such a thing in the Lutheran church. That there were Lutherans that were born again, but it was not something that was preached. Uh, not generally. Anyway, uh, no, historically there was. There was actually a movement, but it was killed off in the United States by the Civil War. It's just a side effect, but it's related. The Lutheranism that was in the United States prior to the Civil War was very much evangelical. There was a renewal movement not too long after Luther. L Lutheranism had gotten very scholastic, very highbrow, uh, and it was just a system of doctrine. And reformers like uh, uh, Jacob Spencer came along saying, no, there, you must be born again. There must be a real a real change in you. You must know Christ. There must be uh, God's salvation in you, a reality of that. And that affected your life because Lutherans were known as people that uh, believed in Christ but lived like the world. <laughs> it wasn't, uh, even Luther uh, bemoaned that fact that uh, even the Catholics were more devout and godly than the Lutherans. <laughs> Because it was, it had been reduced in the minds of so many Lutherans to simply a dead orthodoxy, just a dead faith, not a living faith. And that's, you know, th those things don't really hold. But the 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 fundamentalist modernist controversy was between the apostates and the Bible believers. That's what it was. There are Bible-believing Presbyterians, by the way. Even if they got this weird thing called Calvinism. I, I just can't help myself sometimes. Uh, I say that with a smile, you know. I'm not trying to be nasty about it. Uh, you just need to repent of that. Now, Calvinism wasn't all wrong. It's just, it's just when he gets down to the in the confession to the, to the, their description of God. That's where the the real. It gets sort of ugly, it's where where they where they depart from being biblical. The same problem with Baptists. When fundamentalist Baptists, which is simply old school evangelical Baptists, that's what you're supposed to be, brothers and sisters, holding to the fundamentals of the faith lose that and start focusing on dead fundamentalist orthodoxy, phew, you're gone. You're, you're on the same road as a modernist. You will not hold. You will not hold. You will not endure. Because you don't you're not grounded in Christ. Christ is not in you. And without him as your anchor and your compass and your sails, you're lost. You're just a wreck, a drift in the sea in the process of sinking. Or run up on the rocks, however you want to picture that metaphor. A ruin. A ruin. We are saved by the grace of God through faith in Christ, and that alone. What's happened is, along the way, people lost sight of that. And many of them, because they were not born again. Fundamentalism became all about fighting about doctrine and fighting against the modernists and the pseudoscience. So it became all up in fighting against evolution, all up in fighting all kinds of culture wars, uh, fighting uh, for prohibition and all kinds of things like that that have nothing to do with Christ. Wanting to fix the world. 
They had divided loyalties. They were trying to fix the world. Just like Jerry Falwell turned his back on Christ pretty much and decided, created an organization rather than the church. Uh, I well, All kinds of people come, Jews, Muslims, everybody come and let us fight pornography. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Bill, uh, uh, Jerry Falwell did not practice New Testament Christianity. And everything that's wrong with fundamentalism today is because they do not practice New Testament Christianity. They do not abide in Christ, abide in the doctrine of Christ, abide in the teaching of the New Testament, but rather in their traditions, which they justify through the scriptures. That's what's wrong. Everything that's ugly out there in fundamentalist Baptists is because of that. And this, of course, independent churches are independent churches, and you can't talk about them as a whole. But I, from many, many years of experience, seeing many, many independent fundamentalist Baptist churches and being part of them and everything else, I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, okay? The good ones are in love with Christ. The bad ones are in love with themselves. And they're distinctives. They make a lot about their distinctives and following their rules and everything else. Those are not old evangelicals. And real fundamentalists are the old evangelicals, the evangelical Orthodox Christians. And one of the things that's really ugly is unbiblical separation. Ugly! I separate from you because you don't hold to my personal standards. This happens within independent fundamentalist Baptists seen it way too much. You don't see quite the obvious stuff as you used to. The length of a man's hair. The kind of glasses he wears. Because back then, wire rim glasses were a new thing. Anything new marks you off as ungodly. That was sort of the idea. Uh, everything resisted everything. Of course, women's pants. How many sermons have they preached on women's pants? Now, when it was new, I mean, women deliberately putting on men's clothes was one thing that is condemned in the scripture. Uh, nowadays, they put on, I mean, it's way, be, uh, transgenderism is way past uh, cross dressing. And even cross dressing, I mean, it's. It's not what they imagined it to be. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is, these people were just, they didn't even know what they were talking about, a lot of this stuff. But basically, is anything different than their tradition? It's like, you're not one of us. You're not saved. And that's it. I mean, the, the, the can you imagine uh, separating from somebody because their hair touched the top of their ears? They did it. Uh, separated from somebody because they had a beard. They chose to have a mustache or a beard. That was that was for for Bolton. A, a rebel would be like a, a man that had a motorcycle, a pastor that owned a motorcycle, a little motorcycle. That would oh, that he's a he's a radical. He's a, he's a liberal. It was that bad, and still is in some places. Separating, breaking the fun. What's the fundamental commandment of Christ to his his church? Love one another. They throw that commandment out, just like the Pharisees, in order to keep their personal traditions, their personal standards. Because you don't hold to my personal standards, which aren't taught in the Scripture. Not God's standards. My standards, I separate from you. This is, this is notor they're notorious for this kind of stuff. Notorious for, oh, you're, and, only fundamental Baptists are saved, apparently. This is an attitude that's present in many places, in many individuals, because they don't hold to the Scripture. They don't hold to Christ. They're into their own tradition and their own self, and 
their own doctrines that are uh, distinct from Orthodox Christianity. See, the idea of Baptist distinctives, how God must be offended by that. How Christ must be offended by that. Who, to, who gives a Christian the right to set himself apart and is, have his own doctrines rather than simply the doctrine Christ has given us in the New Testament? You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to make up your own church covenant or your own church statement of faith. God has given us a statement of faith. It's called the New Testament. He's given us a covenant. It's called the New Covenant. You don't get to make anything else because anything else is not of Christ. The fundamental Baptists, the problem is they're not fundamental. Because they have left the essentials of the faith to major, and I'm doesn't apply to everyone, okay? If you're a fundamental Baptist, you know exactly what I'm talking about because you've seen it. You have seen it. They major in the minors and forget the fundamentals. They forget Christ. They forget his command to love the brethren. And the brethren are all those who have been born again in whom dwells the Spirit of Christ. That's the difference between a Christian that's saved and a Christian that's not. Have you been born again? That is old evangelicalism. You understand? Fundamentalism has to be has to go back to being fundamental and understand the difference between what's essential and what's not. And the New Testament makes that point very clearly. There were problems in the early church. Differences about... Uh, can I eat food that's been sold in the market that was perhaps from animals slaughtered in sacrifice? Paul makes a lengthy discussion about that. Talks about uh, the brethren who are weak in conscience and who are offended by, overly, easily offended by too much. And that describes too many Christians. So if you don't have their scruples, their personal scruples, you know, like the, the, the traditional American holiness code, which the Baptists had too, not only the holiness denominations, but don't play. Uh, so the, against everything, the dangers of anything new. And of course, this goes back to other careers, to whether you have an organ in your church or a piano, which are new things because you could finally order them from Sears and Roebuck, you know. One time, you know, only big churches could have things like that, not frontier churches. So any, any kind of a change was resisted without people thinking about it and, and without or brought things in without thinking about how does this affect our worship. Not bothering to, to just going by their gut rather than what God says. In the... Uh, well, I don't call Churches of Christ Christian generally because they don't have the gospel. That is the dividing issue. The gospel. The gospel. Are we saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone? Anybody that denies that, they're outside. They are not evangelical. They are not orthodox. Regardless of what other they, else they have, at this is, because this is where Paul drew the line in his epistle to the Galatians. He said, you have cut yourself off from Christ because you're seeking to be justified by Christ plus a work of the law, a work of circumcision. Because te bad teachers were coming around, the Judaizers were coming around, teaching them that Jesus isn't sufficient. You must keep this element of the Mosaic Covenant too. And Paul said, You've cut yourself off from Christ. Christ will be of no benefit to you if you do this. And how many Baptists try to live by principles rather than faith in Christ alone? How many Baptists have been convinced by bad preachers 
that they have to follow these Old Testament principles. They simply rename the law as principle, but the word namas means principle and or law. It's the See, these people think they can, just like the Jewish Pharisees thought they could schnooker God with their traditions, so do, see, it, it, this is human sinfulness. There's too many dead preachers in fundamentalist churches, people that have never been born again. They, You know, this is one of the, the things that ha I've noticed over decades. And the first church I joined after being saved was what? A independent fundamental Baptist church. So I have sufficient experience here. And over the years, I've tried to, you know, I've tried to work with different churches, but I think the reason, let me confess, one of the reasons I've looked in some odd places like the Nazarenes was I was so disgusted with some of the stuff I saw among independent fundamentalist Baptists. Disgusted. I mean, this isn't Christian. Some of the things you see there are not of Christ. That, has, that leaven has to be removed, brothers and sisters. We have to get rid of that. We have to be go, go back to being old school evangelicals, which were the fundamentalists at the beginning. We have allowed all this corruption to come in. It's through ignorance, it's through ignorance and shallow preachers. Sometimes, uh, one of the things I hesitantly say about fundamentalist Baptists is. Their faith sometimes is like a gallon of cheap paint. Have you ever bought some cheap bargain paint? I remember one time Menards had paint free. They had coupon uh, thing, and that's one type of paint. Uh, we use some of it in the house here. You could actually, you, you got the rebate, and it actually came out to be zero cost. I regret having bought that. Why? Because it took like three coats to do the work of one gallon of good paint. So it was a false economy. You spent all that extra work and aggravation, and then it was a weird color. It wasn't really what it should have been. It was supposed to be beige, and it was more like a greenish thing. Uh... And it was, it was not a bargain at all. And sometimes we have this system of faith that is not biblical, it's not of Christ, it's, it's shallow and easy in some ways, and you don't really have to think about it. And it, it's, you can have it without Jesus himself. It's, it's, it's like... So much of Christianity, it's, uh, I mean, Christianity in Africa sometimes is described as a mile wide and an inch deep. It's, you know, it looks impressive, but it's, there's, not, there's shallowness to it, a shallowness. And, uh, and even fundamentalists, you'd think that wouldn't be, but there's a shallowness to it in the fact that it's so much of it is not biblical. It's not truly following Christ. It is following men's opinion. And there's there's way too much fear uh, among fundamentalists. Fear of being not conforming and being rejected for being a nonconformist to the groupthink. These things have to go. We have to be focused on Christ and a living relationship with him. That's when we're solid. That's when Christians are solid. And to get rid of this false separationism that, that if, if they're not an independent fundamentalist, Baptist, they're not a Christian. We can't have fellowship with them because they're not of like faith and practice. Well, guess what? There's a lot of faith and practice among independent Baptists that needs to be gotten rid of because it's not from God.
And if you've been a long time fundamental independent Baptist, you know what I'm talking about. You yourself have been a victim of some of it. If you've talked like as a pastor to another pastor, you hear the complaints from pastors about the practices of independent fundamentalist Baptists. How they feel like they're under bondage. They're not going to tell this to their congregation, but you know if they're sitting down having a meal with another pastor, that they will, yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll open up. they got somebody. Now I've got someone I can complain to. Yeah, about, I remember this, uh, I'm not going to name names, but this, uh, this couple that was uh, a, a sort of missionary. Uh, they had a, a mission on the Mexican border and a youth ranch on the Mexican border. And, and uh, they invited us over for a spaghetti dinner. <laughs> it's like, I was introduced to spaghetti by my mother-in-law, really, uh, who came. From, her mother came from Italy, so it was it was. Uh, uh, well, I wouldn't call it spaghetti. It was like spaghetti with watered-down ketchup on it. It's like, what? It's the, hmm. Oh well, I like the food I grew up with. Oh my! But anyway, that's beside the point. But the. Uh, you don't want your Christianity to be like that spaghetti. You want it to be real. You want the real thing. And once you've found the real thing, the other will never satisfy you. That's a good illustration, come to think of it. Uh, but uh, the co complaining about how they felt they were under continual bondage and they were because they can't do this and they can't do that and they got to conform and act in a certain way and everything else, they're not free to follow Christ. That kind of bondage is toxic. It is not from Christ. Don't do it. And that's one of the reasons, uh, 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 you know, you, you might find by standing up and saying, this isn't right, that a lot of people are going to agree with you because they're under the same bondage. They don't like it either, but they're afraid to speak out. They're afraid to speak out. It's like this, this he, he would not have... Be because like an omission, he's re re dependent on financial support from a lot of churches. They're afraid that they'll offend their supporters and all the money stops. Because there's too many churches like that. That if you don't conform to their own sta standards of man-made standards, if you don't believe exactly like them and practice exactly like them, you're blackballed. You're cut off. Once the word gets around, you're outside in the cold. And everybody that's knowledgeable about the movement or been in the movement knows this to be a fact. It's got to go. This kind of stuff will destroy us. It will destroy Bible-believing Christianity. Born-again Bible-believing Christianity, which is really what we're talking about. People who are born again, who love Jesus Christ, who believe in the Scriptures and follow New Testament Christianity. If we're trying to be something different than that, we are not walking down the right road. Christ is the narrow way that ends in life, eternal life. We follow him. He is eternal life. He is our righteousness. He is our salvation. He is our hope. He is everything. And if we're about other things, like culture wars and fighting against this and fighting against that, being militant against the world, you're not following Christ. That's not what he did nor what he told us to do. The problem is independent fundamentalist Baptists are not biblical enough, and too many of them are not born again. They're not following Christ. And they set up their own standards, just like the Pharisees, as if they were the word of God. Too often. I'm telling you the truth because I love you.
And if fundamentalist independent Baptists don't get back to old evangelicalism, to their roots, they will be blown away also. Tradition and standards will not save you from the flood, from the world. It will overwhelm you. Only in Christ is there salvation and safety. You'll end up shipwrecked. Your church will end up shipwrecked. That stuff's got to go. Anyone who has been born again, in whom the Spirit of God, Spirit of Christ, dwells, is our brother and sister, and we must love them. We cannot separate ourselves from people based on our standards, only upon God's standards. And you better understand what those are. The first commandment Jesus has given to his church, and perhaps the only one, is to love the brethren. If somebody is born again, if the Spirit of Christ in the, is in them, they are your brother or sister. And you are not allowed to separate from them. You, we only are told to separate from those whose lifestyles demonstrate that they are not in Christ. Not allowed to for some petty thing to say, I don't like you, I don't like the way you do, I don't like the way you appear, therefore, you're out. You know, God saved a lot of people back in the, a uh, lot of young people back in the late 60s and early 70s in the Jesus movement. There was a lot of bad stuff going on in there. There's about, so there's bad teachers. Not all of them, though. And, I mean, the fundamental Baptists weren't out in the front. They weren't. You had Chuck Smith there inviting them in. And he's been roundly criticized for that. But he was more concerned with their salvation than their hair. He had the wisdom from God not to say, if you're going to come in here and be part in, in our worship service, you got to cut your hair first. You got to conform to our external rules. No. He said, Are you looking for Christ? Come here. I was not, I didn't have long hair. I didn't have any of that. I was a rebel against that stuff. I thought that was, I, I didn't conform to the youth movement. But in spite of that, there were, I mean, there, but there was people around me when I was in the Air Force, other young people, that God had saved. And he kept bringing them by as roommates. I didn't know what to do with this stuff. I mean, I wasn't born again. But then, not too long after that, I was. And everything changed. Well, I didn't change completely outwardly. Inwardly, I was transformed. That is what evangelicalism is all about. Old evangelicalism. Not the evangelicalism of Rick Warren and Bill Hybels and the NAE, who know nothing of salvation, apparently. They are following the world because they love the world. They are the new modernists. They are apostates. They don't believe the gospel. The gospel is the central issue. Who Christ is, what he did, and how that can apply to us. How we can be saved by what he did. Get those things wrong. Everything's wrong. And sometimes if you focus on something other than those things, you're not serving him at all. You don't need to have something new to talk about on Sunday morning. You need to have him to speak about. If you're not talking about Christ, I don't want to hear you. 
you want to do a uh, three a six year series walking through the books of Moses, I don't want to go to your church. You want to spend two years going through Proverbs? I don't want to hear it. Because I wasn't saved by Solomon. I wasn't saved by Moses. You can't be saved by them. You can only be saved by Christ. I want to hear about Christ and what he did. Christ crucified for my sins will never get old. If that's old for you, if you're tired of hearing about the cross, if you're tired of hearing about Christ, you need to be saved. If your church is about preaching something other than Christ and Him crucified, if that's not the focus of your church, your church needs to repent. I know there's a lot of fundamental independent Baptists out there that know what I'm saying is true. Have the courage to follow Christ. Pray. Ask Christ to, first of all, cleanse you from the leaven, from man's leaven that has accumulated over the years. See, the leaven has to be renewed once in a while. Or starts growing bad stuff. The Old Testament, the well, it was, it was for the you know Passover. You had to clean out the old leaven and start with a new lump every year. There's a lesson in there, isn't there? See, we need to re renew our commitment to Christ. That's what communion is supposed to be is to come back to him and renew our first love. One of the churches, I think, in the book of Revelations, Christ says, you have lost, you have left your first love. Well, who's the first love? He is. They got caught up in other things. If we are not in him, bound to him, wed to him, we will not endure what's happening today and what's happening down the road. We will be swept away by the world, just like the modernists were, by the new science. Though it's not science at all. The world, the flesh, and the devil will sweep you away unless you're anchored in Christ. Unless he is your love. Have you grown cold to Christ? Time to repent. Go back. And be renewed. Ask him to renew your love. To restore you to what he wants you to be. To recenter yourself in him. Because he is our life forever.